What a delight to be here in Cork today. Um, and, uh, and what an honor to uh, follow in, in after, uh, right after Ronan. Um, what I'd like to do is actually continue on the same track that, uh, that Ronan just uh, started with new technologies, the challenges that, uh, that we're living in, in in cybersecurity and how these new technologies can help us. Um, I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for IBM, which means that um, my team is responsible for keeping the company secure. We're a uh, large-ish large -ish enterprise. Um, we're in, active in 197 countries, uh, just under 400,000 employees. And um, the estate, let's say, that I worry about is over uh, a million and a half um, computer strong. Um, you can imagine that uh, you know, the, the, the challenges that we're dealing with are um, enormous, but they're pretty much the same as um, what you're dealing with um, in Ireland. So, and you know, everybody knows what here at stake, we get more and more things to secure. Just in IBM, we're talking about a million and a half devices, but they tend to all be on a network and it tend to be different kind of things that I worry about than, um, than what you can imagine. It's not just the servers and laptops of employees, it's our building management systems, um, the, uh, the elevators, the access control systems, the cameras, uh, recently, it was in the news that, um, that the American um, Department of Defense is still struggling with uh, removing or replacing thousands of uh, Chinese-made um, surveillance cameras that they uh, are afraid have backdoors. Um, companies around the world have similar issues with understanding everything that they connect to their network. Where does it come from? Can I trust it? We live in a world that, uh, where everybody is, everybody's data is hugely at risk. Um, every day there's another uh, newspaper article or, or news story about a big data breach. Um, this is unlikely to uh, change anytime soon. We'll, we're all getting used to it. Um, I live in the United States. I'm originally uh, from the Netherlands, but I live in the US and we have I get so many letters um, throughout the year of we've had a breach and we can offer you free credit monitoring, which is hopefully a uniquely uh, U.S. thing. I don't, I don't, I hope that um, um, systems in Europe are a little bit uh, more privacy resilient that way. Um, the, the other interesting fact is that if you look at how big this cybercrime um, universe is. Uh, it's estimated that cybercrime is now much more profitable even than the global drug trade. Um, on, the, on the defender side, governments, um, private companies, um, from, from small to large companies, we're dealing um, not just in Europe with GDPR. Uh, companies worldwide are dealing with the impact of GDPR and the kinds of um, responsibility that brings for protecting customers' data, employees' data, as well as the, um, the challenges of having to inform the right authorities if something happened to the data. Um, we're dealing with uh, millions of unfulfilled jobs, um, and that's in every country. Uh, that's also in Ireland. Um, we have, um, we continue to struggle with finding enough um, skilled talent, and um, of course we have far too many tools. I think just in my organization we're dealing with um, dozens, maybe 80 different products, security products from 40 different vendors, and we're doing all we can to simplify that, but it's, it's not easy. Um, so that said, what does it have to do with cybersecurity? <laughs> well, Available skills. As I mentioned, skills are not widely available. So how can we supplement uh, a lack of human talent with um, artificial intelligence? 
There's a huge promise in artificial intelligence. This year, globally, um, across industries, the expectation is that companies will spend over 30 billion US dollars on, um, on AI technologies. And in 2021, that's uh, expected to be over 50 billion. Um, and so across industries, we're looking and across, across competencies, we're looking at how artificial intelligence and machine learning can help. Um, there is, we're dealing with, so skills. Second point is we're dealing with so much data and uh, so much complexity of data that uh, at the human level, um, and there's, there's almost no chance we can keep up with this. Um, we have in our security operations center, 24 seven groups of analysts looking at um, threats against our networks, our systems, and just the sheer number of different threats and understanding um, where that threat comes from and what to do with it requires the help of uh, artificial intelligence technologies. And finally, available time is a challenge. The company CrowdStrike, um, we may have heard of, they do um, a lot of, um, they help companies with uh, uh, breach recovery. And they um, uh, estimated that just looking at nation state attacks from Russia and Chinese state actors to our networks um, has gotten so much more sophisticated and fast that they defined a metric called breakout time. And breakout time is the time it takes for a sophisticated attacker to move from system one that they've breached in the network to a second system. Of course, the quicker they're able, the attacker is able to move in your network, the quicker you have to detect them and take action. Otherwise, they'll be too far gone in the network. And CrowdStrike estimates that the, the average time for um, a Russian nation state actor to go from first system to a second system is 19 minutes. So that gives you an indication of how quickly you need to detect that something is going on on a laptop or on a server and do something about that before, before it's almost too late and, and you lose track of the attacker. So the time is going down. Second issue of time completely in a different space is uh, requirements from governments and regulators to notify that your company has had a breach. Um, that is in many countries and, um, uh, and jurisdictions 72 hours. We see it in some jurisdictions go back to 24 hours. It requires you within 24 hours to have a really good understanding of what happened, um, what was breached, what data was compromised in order to go back to the regulator or the government with a good enough story. So all of this says artificial intelligence, how can it help? Now, interestingly, I've been in the security space for about 20 years. Um, and um, Back when I was in university, the, um, the most popular class, let's say, this is a, a technical university in the Netherlands, uh, most popular class was introduction to programming. And so having grown up at that time, the way, and, and still the way uh, many of the older um, audience members have grown up, if they've grown up in technology, it, you think of data as that's something that you put in a database, um, you write procedural codes to and algorithms to, um, to work with the data. Right now, I would uh, challenge everyone to go to the college here at, in, in Cork, but also um, in, in other countries, even I've looked at Stanford and MIT in the US, for example. The most popular course in these uh, technical tracks is Introduction to Machine Learning. So the people that come out of university right now um, have a completely different way of thinking about data. They don't think about data as something that you store in records in a database and then write programs and algorithms to deal with it. They think of it as, if I have enough data, I can train a machine learning model to make sense of that data. That's a fundamentally different concept. Um, 
and that gives uh, that gives college uh, graduates right now different tools to think about solving problems than what we had 20 years ago. That's very promising. Um, in IBM, we have a lot of um, uh, software developers and engineers from all different age groups. And so what, we've, what we're trying to do is educate even those that haven't come and graduated from college recently to give them these capabilities and these tools. And so we founded something that we call AI University. And um, those are advanced professional development classes inside our company to help engineers gain knowledge and skills in, uh, in artificial intelligence. And I'm happy to say that even on my uh, security team, the developers that, uh, that work not on products for the markets, but that work on defending the company are going through that kind of training uh, and obtaining those skills to, to work with these same technologies themselves. Now, I've mentioned AI and machine learning a couple of times, and, and you will hear it from a number of the, the partners that are present here um, at the conference. Uh, of course, Ronan's venture, um, Get Visibility, and, um, and another partner here, uh, Vectra. Um, they are um, very vocal about using uh, artificial intelligence to solve problems. And what I wanted to do is give you a little bit of a, sort of a mental framework for how to think about the kinds of problems that are solvable with artificial intelligence. And the way I think about it is in, in three different categories. Predictive analytics, intelligence consolidation, and, and then trusted advisors and response. They're different, and, it's, um, um, and, and so most of what you're going to hear from companies in the cybersecurity space with products is in the first category. It's predictive analytics. Predictive analytics is really good at taking massive amounts of data. So think about sensors on a network that look for anomalous behavior. Predictive analytics is really good at understanding what is normal behavior and what may be an attacker. Similarly, with predictive analytics, we can now automatically track behavior of people, for example, or of applications, detect malware, um, uh, detect sensitive data. You know, you can now uh, feed lots of data um, in legacy systems, you can use artificial intelligence to very quickly find where's the sensitive data that I really need to protect under GDPR and, and other privacy regulations. Um, but it also includes technologies like biometric authentication, which is a new way of understanding who sits behind a computer. Biometric authentication um, on a, on a uh, that's being developed and available now on smartphones, understands from the way that the user interacts with the smartphone, the, you know, the, how hard you press your finger on the screen, how fast you swipe, how thick your swipe, swipe is, how long, et cetera, the location of the phone, what networks it's connected to, about 200, 250 different parameters. It can recognize if this is really me that's using my banking applications or if somebody else uh, has taken my phone and is now using it, or is impersonating me. So it's a wide variety of technologies. The, um, and I would, I would venture to say that 95% of the technologies that we're seeing being successful right now are in this category. They're typically fairly narrow types of artificial intelligence or machine learning. We're not talking about generalized AI and reasoning. We're talking about very narrow applications. And um, as practitioners, um, that is useful because we're getting increasingly benefits out of uh, machine learning um, based tools. Second category would be intelligence consolidation. What if we had a technology that could read regulations that are changing in so many different countries every day that could keep up with changing laws, that could keep up with research that's happening in, in security. 
Um, interestingly, there are a number of technologies already in play today. In, inside IBM, we use uh, artificial intelligence to do exactly that, keep up with government regulations so that we don't have to have hundreds of people tracking this on a daily basis. We're using it, uh, and this is also in some of our products, um, to keep up with um, uh, threat research and other you know, regularly written text to analyze it and, and pick out um, critical data elements that can then be used to reason about a cybersecurity problem. Very interesting field um, and, and quickly developing. The third category is trusted advisors, and this is the category that I'm personally the most interested in. There's a dirty secret in security operations um, that has to do with how dependent we are on humans to do the work. If it takes a security analyst, let's say, on the basis of an alert in the security operations center, half an hour to do the background investigation, and we have an analyst seat 24-7 um, occupied, so probably three people over the course of a day. That means half an hour times 24 hours in a day, um, you can handle 48, let's say 50 investigations, alert investigations per day. So now you have two seats. That takes already seven people to, um, um, to be able to staff that 24-7. You can do maybe 100 alerts per day. What if we could do 10,000 or 100,000 using automation, uh, using machine learning? Uh, that would give us a, a tremendous opportunity to tune the sensitivity of our detections to be much more, have, have much more sensitivity. We could risk a lot more false positive. We could investigate a lot more in depth than what we could do with people. Um, similarly, there's an activity that's called threat hunting where you, take, you go through all your data and you go look for adversaries. With uh, artificial intelligence, um, we can do that work much faster and, and into much more detail. Um, this is the area that uh, I'm, I'm the most excited about because of how much people effort it takes to be able to manage a security operations center for 24, uh, 24 hours a day. Um, our attackers, the adversary, of course, is uh, not sitting still. Uh, Ronan gave some examples about uh, adversaries using um, uh, artificial intelligence to speed up attacks, to impersonate people, to, with deep fakes, uh, impersonate people with the, uh, the audio examples that, uh, that Ronan gave. Um, I would say, you know, if you're in, if you're thinking about artificial intelligence, absolutely think about how are attackers able to use it. They can accelerate attacks, do phishing attacks much more efficiently. A phishing attack is really successful if you if you can um, if you can figure out a way to study your target. For example, on Twitter, there are a lot of uh, phishing attacks on Twitter. People are so vocal on Twitter, it's very um, easy now to understand how people think and then uh, craft an, an attack that will be uniquely uh, targeted to that individual. Um, we now see attacks happening at scale using artificial intelligence that first learns about the habits of somebody and then crafts uh, a targeted attack. Um, Password crackers are very uh, efficient these days, uh, thanks to machine learning. Um, even, you know, um, you know how uh, some websites are using CAPTCHAs, these picture puzzles um, that you need to solve in order to prove that you are not uh, a robot, but, but a human. There is a very um, effective tool available to attackers right now that is trained to solve 8,000 different of these puzzle implementations very quickly. Um, there's another side. Attackers are also going after artificial intelligence implementations. So banks that are using artificial intelligence um, for their uh, financial decision making, insurance companies, healthcare companies, are increasingly using 
artificial intelligence, machine learning models in their operations. We see attacks mounting now by attackers on those uh, artificial intelligence implementations. And there are a number of forms. They can be in the, in the form of evasion. For example, financial institutions that are using artificial intelligence to detect fraudulent um, transactions. Um, evasion attacks are designed to bypass um, the, uh, the, those uh, machine learning models. Um, in addition, there, are, there is uh, the possibility that attackers can um, steal that model. There's a lot of proprietary information, pharmaceutical companies that are using machine learning uh, to design new drugs. If, you, if an attacker can have access to the APIs, they can, just as they're trying to reverse engineer software, they can reverse engineer those models uh, by treating them as a black box, giving certain inputs, and studying uh, the output from that model. Um, I don't want to go into a, a lot of technical depth here, but uh, this is another interesting field, and we see Tentatively, we see now a number of companies um, come up that are starting to address this as a real problem. Um, if you want to keep up, if you're like me or like many of you that are in the field of uh, cybersecurity and you want to keep up with um, the attacks on artificial intelligence, what's possible, what are attackers doing, how do I defend my company machine learning models against attacks? There is so much academic research that you would have to keep up with. Just last year, there were almost 800 academic papers. I expect that uh, this year it will probably be easily double that. The academic community is, is very much interested in, in studying vulnerability of AI as a, as a technology and what to do about it. Um, and if you read those papers, they're hard to read for a developer. Um, a, a large number of papers are now out that describe defenses against those attacks. If you want to implement those, you have to go through those papers and try and, and implement those techniques yourselves. I'm incredibly proud of our IBM research team here in Ireland, in Dublin, um, who have developed an open source library that's available on GitHub, um, that implements the most important attacks uh, against AI models, but also the defenses and uh, ways to measure what they call the robustness of um, artificial intelligence models, machine learning models. Um, it's, uh, it's an open source project. You can find it if you're a developer or so in clients, you can find it on GitHub. Um, this is uh, an incredibly interesting field. I expect, um, I expect uh, a never-ending stream of new innovations in this space. Um, I'll be available here afterwards uh, to discuss with you, if you like, uh, in, in more technical depth. But uh, for now, I thank you so very much for your attention. And um, over to our next speaker.